Dear family in Christ, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Let us look forward to the day when we join him in eternal prayer and peace. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, I give thanks to you for blessing us with a beautiful morning, a beautiful opportunity to come together in fellowship of your name. Lord, help us to remember that each day that we come together, it is not just a random occurrence. It's not just something that we need to do, that we should do. It's something that we need to do. Coming together in your word, remembering your promises, being bold to proclaim those promises. Help us this day to hear your word. Help us this day to, to, to internalize it, to chew on it, to, to inwardly digest it, that we might share it with others. Lord, reassure us. That as you have, uh, that you have paid for our sins on the cross and you have risen from the grave, that we too will rise with you on the last day. In all things, we give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Savior and Lord. Amen. You know, the other day, Carla, Jacob, and I, we ran out of toilet paper, so we had to go to Walmart to go shopping. And well, I guess we didn't have to go to Walmart, but we chose to go to Walmart. And I don't know if you've gone to Walmart on a Saturday recently. If you can avoid it, I'm sure you do. But once you get down that aisle, you'll discover how busy those aisles are, how hard it is to find what you're looking for. Well, going down the aisle, I discovered they didn't carry the toilet paper that we usually buy. So along with all the other people going up and down the aisles looking high and low, I found myself looking for, well, the one I'd like to choose. And you would not believe, unless you've done this yourself, how many choices there are. You can choose virtually any type of toilet paper you can imagine. You can choose one ply, two ply, three ply. You can choose septic safe or virtually indestructible. You can choose scented or unscented. You can get blue or yellow or just plain old white. You can get brand name or no name brand. There's choices to be had. And you know if it's beyond the toilet paper aisle, if you've ever been to Walmart, Target, any other store you go into, there's many, many choices to be had. Well, no matter what you want to buy, it seems like there's at least one other option that you can choose between. We peop as people like choices. We like to choose. Now, that's not to say that when we come to a hard decision that we look forward to choosing and making the right decision. But just imagine for a moment if someone took away your right to choose. If someone took away that opportunity you had, and I'm not just talking about toilet paper here, I'm talking about in day-to-day -day life, you would resent that. You would miss that right to choose. And it so much is part of our nature, part of our lives, that even people at times will choose the parts of Scripture that they like, the parts of Scripture that apply to them, the parts of Scripture that are comfortable, the parts of Scripture that are not so comfortable. I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but maybe you've met someone who they look at Scripture and there's parts that they like and they read often, they pay attention to, and there's other parts that they say, well, that was for Paul 2,000 years ago. Well, one of the things that people love about Scripture, in fact, not just Christians, but beyond the Christian church, is the concept of heaven, the idea of an afterlife. Believe it or not, I know that we are moving away from Christianity as a nation, but still, 81%, according to a Gallup poll, 81% of Americans still believe in heaven. They believe that there's a life after death and that they're going there, that they're going to heaven. Now, if we figure 81%, that's about 216 million, uh, a little higher than that, as opposed to over the last 20 years, we're down to about 16% of Americans in church. About 48 million. So 216 million plus believe that they're going to heaven. 48 million are in church. Numbers don't exactly compute, do they? But it's not surprising, is it? Because we look at heaven, we look at this, what Scripture says, and heaven is going to be a beautiful, amazing place. Heaven is going to be a place of rest, a place of comfort, a place of joy. The old children's so song, maybe you guys remember this, heaven is a wonderful place filled with glory and grace. And, and, the, and it goes on from there. Even though our kids know that heaven is going to be a wonderful place. Many people choose to look forward to that day of heaven because we see the wonder, the joy, the greatness. Even John, he tries to describe it and he tries so hard, but e even he, with his Human eyes cannot describe the beauty of heaven. Just listen again to, to, to Revelation 21, and this is verses 3 through 5 here. And this is John just trying to take a step out there to describe the, the glory of heaven. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, 
Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. Heaven truly a wonderful place. Heaven truly a real place. Heaven, contrary to the 80s song, is not a place on earth, but it is a place that God even now is preparing for each one of us. And it is a place that we will be in his presence. Perhaps more than anything else, that is what we look forward to, is being in that endless presence of God. We get a small taste of it every Sunday when we eat at the altar of his body and blood, but it is a small taste preparing us for the victory feast that we look forward to. Heaven brings comfort. How many of us have attended funerals, memorial services, where we've said to somebody, she's now in a better place. He's free from his pain. He's in the hands of the Lord. And you hear these words even outside of Christian services. You hear people who say that they're now in a better place because people don't want to believe in annihilation, which is one of the alternatives. Annihilation, the idea we just cease to exist. People want there to be something greater. They want there to be something more wonderful because we go through so many ups and downs in this life, so many trials of this life. We want there to be a place where there are not the downs, where there are not the lowest lows that we face. And so even those outside the church, 81% of Americans look forward to, at least, to an afterlife of joy. And even as Christians, one of the beautiful truths we have is that promise of Christ that we are going there. That we are going to be joining our Lord. John chapter 14, he reassures his disciples, and you're probably familiar with this text because it's a very familiar one. Early on he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. But earlier than that even, right at the very beginning of 14, he says this, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. Beautiful promise of our Savior that he is even now preparing a place for us in the rest of the Lord. An assurance that we have, a hope that we look forward to, that even as we do face the sins and trials of this life, that Jesus is even now preparing a place for us. So oftentimes, though, we, we look at death and we, we see it as, well, this passageway to eternal life. Maybe you've even heard that proclaimed before or preached before. But this is wrong. Because death is a bad thing. Death is an awful thing. Death is the tearing apart of the body and the soul which God brought together in creation. And well, yes, death has been redeemed by Christ. It was originally given to us as punishment for sin. If you go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, perhaps many of you can quote this verse with me. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God through Christ Jesus is eternal life. Romans 6, verse 23. Death is not a good thing. Death is, even you know this, even if we don't have to talk about it. Because those of you who have lost someone, someone you care about, you know the pain that you have on your heart. You know the mourning that you've experienced, maybe the mourning that you continue to experience. You know that death is ugly and it's messy. And only Christ's redemption thereof could make anything good of death. Because that is the only reason that we can look at death with hope. It is because of what Christ did on the cross. He transformed death once and for all. He transformed death instead of being death eternally. He gave us the promise of life. And yes, we still experience that pain, suffering of death, that loss, that, that bitter loss but we have the promise of eternal life with our Lord, that heavenly rest. 
But you know, one of the things that we so often say is, well, thanks be to God, so-and-so has died and they are in heaven. You know, that's a restful place that God is preparing for us now, that he has prepared for us. But you know, Paul talks about it a little differently. He actually gives us even a greater hope than that rest. We're not intended to just become disembodied spirits, contrary to Hallmark cards. We're not just going to be angels floating around heaven, strumming our harps and doing beautiful things in heaven, floating from cloud to cloud. But God has something greater planned for us. If you go to 1 Corinthians 15, and I know I've used it recently because I'm going to encourage you to go here again in case you haven't yet. But in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says that not so much going to heaven, but what is paramount for us as Christians is the resurrection. The resurrection of all flesh. The resurrection of every person. Because Christ has risen, so too we shall rise. He says, first, this is starting in verse 12 through 14. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. And Paul goes on from there. He spends an entire chapter explaining the importance of the resurrection, a physical resurrection. See, that is the hope that we look forward to. It is not just being disembodied spirits in heaven. Yes, that we are looking forward to that rest. It will be a restful time. But we are looking forward to the last day. The last day when God gives us eternal, uh, when he takes us from that eternal rest, he destroys this heaven and this earth, and he gives us new bodies to walk on his new earth where there will be no more pain or suffering, but only joy in the Lord. And if you don't believe me, like I said, go to 1 Corinthians 15. Look at what revelation, what John, the picture he paints. He's painting the picture of the new Jerusalem. Not merely a place that is spiritual, but a place that is real, that is touchable, that we are going to have joy in. And so it's no wonder that people, when they choose, it's heaven something they like to include. It's no wonder that people, when they look at heaven, it's, they, have no hard, they don't have such a hard time celebrating it. But on the contrary, people look at hell. And remember that study, I support, uh, the survey I mentioned before? Only 69% of people believe that there is a hell. And only 1% of those people believe they are going there. See, they, a lot of times people have no problem with hell as long as it means that the bad people are going there. They have no problem with hell as long as it means the rapists, the murderers, the child molesters, as long as they're going there, great, no problem. As soon as you talk about eternal judgment, though, we'll back up here. God's a loving God. He's a forgiving God. God's compassionate God. He wouldn't send people to hell. In fact, there's a Christian author, Christian pastor, Rob Bell. Maybe some of you are familiar with him. Maybe not many of you are. But he wrote a book by the t entitled Love Wins. And this is the very teaching he teaches people. Is that there is no hell because that's not God. He wouldn't do that. So then what do we do with this? What do we do with God's Word? If it's very clearly in God's Word... Hell is there and hell is a punishment. Hell is not something we're looking forward to. Very clearly in our, our reading from today, from Matthew chapter 25, Jesus said that there will be those who go into weeping and gnashing of teeth, a fires that are prepared for Satan and his angels, or better translation, demons. So, how do we reconcile that? How do, we, how do we look at this and say, wait a minute, if God is a loving God, merciful, isn't Rob Bell right? Isn't anybody who teaches that, that hell's just figurative? Aren't they correct? Well, a lot of people in the world want to believe that. A lot of people in the world want to say that Scripture, no, that's all figurative language, that's all picture language, in order to scare us into heaven. No. Hell is a real place, and it is a scary place. 
And if you don't believe it's there, look throughout your Old Testament and you probably won't find that word hell. In fact, I can guarantee you won't unless you have a modern translation that has made the move for you. But there's a word that shows up time and again. And maybe you've seen it. Sheol. Has anybody seen that in your Bible and wondered what on earth that's doing there? Sheol is a reference time and again to hell. If you look at it in the Psalms, if you look at it almost every time it shows up, it talks about torment and it talks about pain. And just like we can't describe heaven, the beauties and the joys of heaven, the authors of Scripture, they struggle to describe the utter depravity of hell. In fact, the closest thing we ever have to describing hell, a real place, is when Jesus is on the cross. You know, he doesn't cry out to God because he's in physical pain. He doesn't cry out to God because he's in emotional pain. He doesn't cry out to God because he's in mental pain. He cries out to God because God has rejected him. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you turned your back on me and ignored me and left me here? We talk about going through going through hell in our day-to-day lives. We talk about how awful our days can be. But we truly do not know what hell is. Because hell is completely divorced from God. Hell is a complete separation from God, and it is a painful place. It is a scary place, and it is a place that is prepared as a place of torment. You know, we try to make it a more comfortable place. Halloween, a lot of kids put on costumes. Maybe you've looked into the roots of Halloween before. If you haven't, then this will be a brief history lesson. Halloween originally came about because of the, uh, because of the, the way they believed that in the Druid religion that the earth and the spiritual world were coming into, uh, into alignment. And so spirits were coming into our world. And so they thought to scare off these spirits, all the kids would wear costumes. And these costumes would scare off the spirits. And, well, and that's where that idea of the devil with his horns and his little tail came from. That's not what hell is. If it was, it'd be a little more comfortable, wouldn't it? Hell is indescribable anguish and indescribable pain. And it's a very real place. And it is a place that is even now being prepared for those who reject God. For those who reject Jesus' promise, Jesus' Jesus's words that he is the way, the truth, and the life. It's a hard thing for us to talk about. We don't like to tell people about hell. It's much easier to talk about heaven. Heaven's comfortable. Heaven's wonderful. Heaven's beautiful. Hell's not. But it is there. Because not only is our God a loving God, but he is a just God as well. See, when Jesus paid for our sins on the cross, God didn't just suddenly say, oh, good, great, and pretend our sins weren't there. Jesus made payment for our sins on the cross. He was our Redeemer. He, by His blood, paid the price for our sins so that we would not experience this hell. He experienced hell so that we would not have to. And those who reject that gift, because He's made it available to every person, those who reject that gift, they've accepted punishment for their sins. They've accepted that decision. As hard as it is to talk about, even though only 1% of people want to believe they're going there, it is a real place. And it, honestly, no, ma- no, ma- no matter how many Gallup polls we have, Pew Forum polls, Barna polls, that say people believe in heaven or don't believe in heaven, those who believe in hell or don't believe in hell, No matter what our true perspective is, if we don't want to believe in hell, it exists. And thanks be to God, heaven exists as well and the promise of the resurrection. And truly, our lives on earth are significant. Our faith is significant because we are looking forward to an eternal reality with our Lord. We are not just looking forward to ceasing to exist but we are looking forward to an eternal reality of eternal life. For all who believe in our baptized have been given that promise of salvation, that promise that we shall be saved, that promise that we will spend eternity with our Lord in His presence. And sadly, that second half of Mark 16.16 says, And all those who do not believe shall be condemned. 
It doesn't get much clearer than that. I don't know about you, but when I think about that verse, when I think about the descriptions of hell in, in, in Scripture, it makes me want to see every person saved. It makes me, if it was up to me, I would make sure every person was saved. And I hope that, it, that as you think about that, it may move, that God moves in your heart to, to feel the same way. Because truly what he was talking about there in Matthew 25 was not about all those works that are going to account for anything here on earth, but it is all those works that we do to help people see God. God doesn't need our good works. He doesn't need us to visit him when he's hungry or thirsty or when, he's, when he, well, God is never in prison. He's never hungry. He's never thirsty. He doesn't need that. But, he said, but when Jesus addresses the disciples, he's telling them the way that they show love, the way that they show love to others is a reflection of God's love for them. Truly the way we live in this world Truly, the lives we touch has eternal consequences. And I hope that you see that the faith life that God has given you, that you see how important it is that you live each day as his child, that you see that there is truly an up and a down, that there is a heaven and a hell. And those real places are there. But I hope also, and I pray, that as God desires all people to be saved, that you too, would desire for all people to be saved, to, to fill up heaven and to make it full. May God's grace, may his peace, and may his mercy dwell with you now and always. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, as we go about our lives each and every day on this earth, as we go through the struggles, the pains, the difficulties, we know that even amidst these pains and difficulties that we can cling to the hope of the resurrection, the promise that one day that we will spend eternity with you forever. Lord, may that hope continue to fill our hearts and fill our lives. May it, fill, may it, may it change the way we live and change the way that we treat others, that we know that you are using us. Forgive us for those times, O oh Lord, when we want to deny parts of your word that are making us uncomfortable. When we, when we want to ignore parts of your word that convict us. Forgive us and reassure us that by your payment for our sins on the cross that you have paid for them in full. Reassure us that by your resurrection we too will physically rise with you. We too will again walk, but not on this earth, but on the new earth. Lord, we pray for those who do not at this time have faith. We pray for those who do not know you as their Savior, and we pray that you would work in their hearts and in their lives. Send us to be your witnesses. Send us to witness to you, whether it be by bringing food to the hungry, water to the thirsty, visiting those who are sick, or visiting those who are imprisoned. Lord, use our actions of love to show your love that all may come to know you. Lord, we pray that you would use us, use all your people, to proclaim your gospel message that to the very ends of the earth, that all may come to know your salvation. This we pray through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.